Uh, closing statements, trade disclosures. Let's talk a little bit about trade disclosures. This is funny. There are two disclosures. One is called the Truth in Lending or TILA. Truth in Lending. This deals with the terms of the loan. Think of TILA, starting with T, terms of the loan. This is where Regulation Z happens. Somebody explain to me what Reg Z means. Think of what this uh, anagram stands for. Truth in Lending. Regulation Z deals with what? Disclosing all the loan amounts and all yes. the things you paid. It the deals with the advertising of credit. If I mention a trigger term, I have to mention all of them. So if I said, how much do you think that violation would cost me? I, it probably wouldn't because all you did is say a low down payment, but you didn't tell what the down payment was. Very good. That was a trick question and you passed, Nicole. <laughs> That's not a violation. Why? Because I didn't mention any of the trigger terms. If I'd have said this, Or if I'd have said this, or if I'd have said this, these are all trigger terms. This was a trick question. I could say low down payment, easy, easy payments. I can't say zero down. If I did, I would then have to do that car commercial. Zero down on 150,000 and apply to 4% interest payments monthly at 2%. Not all people will apply. And you hear all of that in those commercials. That's literally what's going on. So this all has to deal with TILA, the truth in lending and Reg Z specifically deals with the advertisement of a property so that it is fair and the consumer knows what they're getting. There is a second one of these that is called RESPA. Somebody tell me what RESPA means. And if you remember these, they should help you. What does RESPA mean? Real Estate Settlement Procedure Act. So guess what this deals with? All of the closing stuff. Truth in Lending dealt with the terms of the advertisement. Truth in Lending. RESPA stands for Real Estate Settlement Procedure. So it deals with the closing. So we integrated these two from the Truth in Lending and we have RESPA and we said, this has two forms. This has two forms. Seems like a lot of forms. So we're gonna integrate this disclosure and now we have this thing called TRID, which combines the Truth in Lending and the RESPA and takes these two forms and says, now we only have combined two. 
We have the loan estimate form and we've got the closing disclosure form. The loan estimate form deals with when a consumer goes into a lender and makes an application for a loan, the lender has three biz days to get that consumer the loan estimate. Hence the word or the slang term, you see it called LE. This, I will virtually bet my house on, is a test question. It is three business days under federal law, the lender or the mortgage broker has to give that loan estimate to the client to show the cost to close that property. They are going to give so the consumer or the borrower knows so that if he goes to Chase Bank and sees that and then goes to Wells Fargo and sees that and then goes to some other Billy Bob Joe Bob's mortgage company and sees that. This allows the consumer to shop and go, oh, I'll go to that guy. And then when they get the loan and they go to close, they get to the second form, which is the closing disclosure. or the slang is the CD, this tells where all that $5,000 is going to. You know, mortgage broker fee, you got a courier fee, you got your home owner's insurance, you've got a loan origination fee, and you've got recording fees. So the closing disclosure is the itemized list of the loan estimate, the easy way to think about it. And this must be given three business days as well before they can close. This gives the actual lender the chance to look at the final numbers. Are we cool with this? It is now reduced from four forms to two. We had TILA over here that had two forms. We had RESPA had two forms. We combined them together and took those four forms and created two more, the loan estimate and the closing disclosure. And the easiest way to think about them is the loan estimate is the cost to buy that house. And the closing disclosure is the itemized version of where those costs go to. In RESPA, there are three sections that we need to talk about. Section eight deals with uh, what is, no kickbacks, right? You cannot pay for a lead. You can't pay your mortgage broker to give you a buyer. You can't play a title company person. There's no kickbacks. Section nine says I cannot force you to use my companies. If the seller says, I want to go to title, Chicago title, the buyer can say, 
I don't want to do that. I want to go somewhere else because Section 9 says you can't force me to buy from your company. I can. I want to buy from my own company. And Section 10 limits the money into the new buyer's escrow accounts. So those are the three sections that you'll probably get questions on that deal with RESPA, the settlement procedure. I cannot pay for a lead. I can't force the other side of the table to buy from the company I choose. And I, the seller, uh, the new owner has limits on to how much he can start his escrow accounts with. Uh, property and income taxes. Let's do some more math. Because some companies have, some states have the property sales tax. And you guys remember this. If it's 50 cents per thousand dollars and the sales price is 225,000, what's the transfer tax on this property. You know what, I'm gonna change the story, hold on. It's 249.5 is the sales price. I want somebody to tell me the transfer tax on that property. Somebody get a number yet? I got 125. 24.75, oh yeah, so she rounded. No. There is a jacked up problem here that you guys need to understand. There are two ways to calculate this answer. And the process by which you calculate it is solely dependent upon what this question says. So you have to watch for this. In this scenario, this is how Florida calculates theirs. It's 50 cents per thousand. So there are 200. What? Somebody needs to mute their microphone. In this particular scenario, there are 249 and a half packets in this times the 50 cents gives you that answer. Now, please pay attention to what I'm saying. If it says 50 cents per thousand or any part thereof, all bets are off. It's now a different scenario. Now, in this, there are 250 packets times 50 cents. You get $125. The key to this is this sentence here.
So if the question says 50 cents per 1,000 or any part of 1,000, see, see how, understand what it's saying? It's per 1,000 or any part of 1,000. You pay 50 cents. So in theory, if we sold this house for 249,001, the tax is still $125 because there's still 250 in there. All the way up to 249,999. Actually, we can even take that back. All the way up to 250,000. Been a long day already. I apologize. All the way up to 250,000. That that whole spread is still 250 packets because it's any part thereof. So in that transfer tax, please read the sentence and does it have that in it or does it not have that in it because it changes the way in this one, you can have the decimals, 249 and a half. In the other one, you cannot. So the answer is the 125 then. The, it, the answer is one, if it says, or any part. Okay thereof. When it says any part thereof, the answer is 125. Because it's any part of a packet. You cannot have a half a packet. You have to go up to the next one. If it says 50 cents per 1,000, it would be 249 and a half, which would translate to that 124.75. Mm -hmm. If it says 50 cents per 1,000 or any part, you can't have that part there it would be 250 of them, which would translate to a tax of 125. Right? Yes. Okay. We've got a number of people, I'm assuming, just give me a thumbs up if you can hear my voice, make sure it's still working, all right, cool. So everything's going on, we're going fine, recording. <clears throat> there are a couple special processes we've already touched on, what foreclosure is. Um, we can talk a little bit about foreclosure. Remember, foreclosure is a court process. It is a special court. Some states have what they call judicial foreclosure, where the judge has to decide. And then if the person then takes it to the sheriff's sale, when they loses. In a non-judicial, and these are usually the lien theory. These are the title theory states. Remember, you've got the person and the bank and then the third party person who owns the house in the title theory, the bank just calls over and they deed the property back. That is a non-judicial foreclosure. 
and foreclosure is a court process by which the judge determines if you are right or wrong. And then if you are wrong in your late payments, you have to repay the IOU. If you don't have the IOU, you surrender the collateral, which is typically the real property. And then that's how the bank ends up with the property. When it goes to sheriff sale, when it goes to sheriff sale and it doesn't sell, the bank takes it back to their office. If the, if the bank underwrote that loan, that's how it becomes a bank owned home or the REO. If the person that got foreclosed on was an FHA loan, so the government makes the bank whole, this is how we get HUD homes in that process. So if the person who went into foreclosure was an FHA, remember that's FHA insured, it would then be, they would pay the bank and make the bank whole, meaning they got all their money, then the FHA would list the property and that's how it becomes a HUD. Real estate students are getting younger every day. <laughs> short sale, we've already kind of discussed a little bit. A short sale is like when you own 100, you owe 100, you get the bank to take 90. That would be short of the amount of money that is owed to the bank. There is a deficit or a deficiency right here. You still owe that deficiency. And then the bank would come after you for what's called a deficiency judgment to get that other 10 grand. Now they might or they might not. It just kind of depends on the bank and the scenario and things like that. But in that short sale, basically you have to prove to the bank that you no longer can afford the loan that they have already given you because the bank has to make sure that they can't get the money from you and the house isn't worth a hundred grand anymore. That's why they would allow this short sale. All the short sale does is save them time so that they are not getting uh, the court process and the attorney engaged and all that. They just take the 90,000 today. There are home warranties. Home warranties are, I don't believe a lot about uh, on the test. I have never heard a question about home warranties or construction warranty programs. Here's another big section. This is actually the practice of real estate. This deals with the brokerage, it's 14% of the course. So we talk about the trust account and remember a bank or a broker must have a trust account in which he must identify as an escrow account. He cannot put anything other than earnest money in that account. If he puts the earnest money into his general account, that is called commingling, right? And then they spend that money on, you know, they go out and they pay their light bill. That's a light bulb in theory. When they pay that, that is called conversion. And typically they get caught with those together commingling and conversion. This earnest money or this escrow or impound account is where the listing agent would put that earnest money. And then when it comes time for the closing, that earnest money comes out and becomes that credit to the buyer 
at the closing table. That escrow account can earn interest, but it becomes very hard to calculate for each person. So what ends up happening is they just say it's a non-interest bearing account. Fair housing laws we have touched on. A lot of this, it looks like we have kind of gotten to. The seven protected classes, we have already touched on the seven protected classes, right? Race, color, religion, national origin, sex, familial status, and disability. Those are the seven protected classes. Redlining some of the rules that fair housing or some of the violations, there was this thing called redlining. And what redlining was literally was exactly what it sounds like it is, where they used to take a red line and draw a circle on a map. And they would say, do not lend money inside of this circle because of the so-and-so people. All right. Now, it's funny, in the mortgage world, there's a thing called reverse redlining, where they intentionally did target the inside of that circle with high interest rate loans, because they knew that that was probably low income, they had nothing else, had no other options or choices, so they used to reverse redline, all right? Block busting. That is called panic selling, panic selling. Panic selling is when you try and scare based on something going to happen to the neighborhood that would lower the value. You know, there are, uh, uh, the I-69 uh, would be an example of panic scaring. You know, hey, we told them we're gonna take their land and all of a sudden they started selling their property. That would be panic selling. Blockbusting is when they used one of the protected classes to do it. Specifically, the word blockbusting would deal with when they were using race as an issue. The Americans with Disabilities Act. Once again, some of this we've kind of got ahead of ourselves, maybe. Titles one and three. There are exemptions to the fair housing. The exemption to the fair housing is going to be anything with four or less that is owner occupied and no agent. So a single family home up to four units that is owner occupied and there's no agent being used, could potentially be an exemption to the Fair Housing Act. The other exemption would be any house where they don't own more than three and there's no agent and they cannot advertise ever a violation like no children that would be a advertising they might get away with saying no children because they have no agent working for them and they own less than three homes that should say not greater than three those would be exemptions to the fair housing there's one other exemption. It's if a group limits the sale to their group. As long as joining that group is not a violation of the seven protected clauses. You know, a fraternal Fraternal Order of Eagles, which you see them called the FOE, can limit the sale to other FOE members as long as joining the FOE.